Well, I'd like to take the opportunity of uh, thanking Gideon for allowing me to speak here. Um, I, I, I intentionally chose a morbid name for this uh, presentation because I wanted to attract your attention. But I truly think that uh, we're in a situation where things need to be done, not only to be discussed. And I'll try to convince you that uh, what we call general surgery today is going to vanish much faster than we expect. So actually, in surgery, we are doing something that's very primitive. Uh, we're doing a manipula mechanical manipulation of tissue. And if we want to uh, drill down to whatever we are really doing is that we are taking things out, uh, we are reconstructing our damage, and we are fixing things. That's all. And uh, today, what is happening, or the trends that uh, the one we're speaking about, uh, will lead to several uh, processes that will need us to make a major change in the way we practice uh, surgery. So minimally invasive is one trend, and uh, minimally invasive is not only a concept that is uh, in surgery, but think of also, for instance, of how uh, oncology medication is, works today. Uh, 20 years ago, we used to give medications that burn everything or kill everything that grows fast. Uh, we're mo more focused on biological medications that zap the tumors. 20 years ago, we would irradiate patients until they glowed in the dark to kill anything that grows fast. Today, we are irradiating focused uh, irradiation on the tumor itself. So the minimally invasive trend, the idea of minimal invasiveness is not only a trend that is in surgery. It's something that the entire medical com community embraces. And it's actually, if you look at it, it's in a way personalized medicine because you personalize, you, you target the, treat, the treatment to the disease, directly to the disease and not to the entire uh, patient. But we're moving from disease-centered uh, medicine to patient-centered medicine because we now understand that different patients respond differently to different treatments, uh, and not only different medical treatments, but different surgical treatments as well. And we're moving to image-guided procedures, robotics, and all this information that uh, Dawn has already elaborated on, so I'm not going uh, directly to, to, to spend more time on them. There are other two trends that I think that are important. One is the training that also Doron uh, touched a little about, and also uh, the economical burden uh, that our medical treatment puts on the society. And I think this is something we cannot uh, overlook anymore uh, as well. So the cost effectiveness and the cost uh, safety profiles of the treatments that we suggest to our patients are things that will be looked at uh, more and more carefully by the society. So the resulting trends are that uh, we are now not, we'll, many of the procedures will move out of the operating room and we move from traditional surgery, from traditional surgery to uh, procedures that are not based in the operating room, do not require, some of them will not require uh, general anesthesia. Uh, and we will have to train and prove our proficiency and perform the, prove that our, we perform well before we perform the procedure and after we perform the procedures and we will have to adapt to using a lot more technology. There's, there's nothing we can do about it. <clears throat> so one more trend that we have to look at is looming in somewhere in the, in the near future is that we're actually going to have a lot less patients who need surgery. Uh, prevention uh, uh, is becoming eff effective. You know that uh, many cancers are declining in their, in their uh, prevalence. I'll show you a chart about that. Many drugs shrink tumors or, or make them completely go away, drugs and, and, and uh, uh, other types of energy. Uh, 20 years ago, nobody would have agreed that if erectile cancer has been treated by radiochemotherapy and disappears, you will not remove the rectum. This is a trend that's growing today. And there are other, many other uh, examples of that. <coughs> Focused irradiation will make solid tumors go away. And genetic engineering, uh, transfection and immunotherapy uh, with pre-surgery uh, treatments may uh, make the, the surgery completely unnecessary. So this is, for instance, a chart of uh, the more common cancers on the planet. As, as you can see, m most of them, except for breast cancer, are in a major decline. And this is real big numbers. Colon cancer, stomach cancer, lung cancer, the biggest killers of uh, oncology are declining very quickly. So I'll try to take you to a short journey of what I think uh, is going to happen to surgery. 
and I think that uh, some of it uh, seems like science fiction and you don't need to act upon, uh, but some of these things I think need immediate action by us as a community of surgeons and people to determine what is the future of surgery is going to be. In the near future, uh, we're going to have a little more robots, uh, small robots, mini robots. We're going to be using much more big data. I don't know if you're aware of that. For instance, even Kopat Cholim Maccabi, the HMO, started a program just utilizing the patient's uh, existing blood counts and their family history of colon cancer to prompt patients to go earlier for a colonoscopy because of their because the artificial intelligence program that they employed tells them that the risk for colon cancer in these specific patients is higher. So this is something that looks very primitive, but we, if you can employ different bots or different artificial intelligence programs on big data for our patients, we'll identify patients who need early interventions on er or even earlier uh, screening. And we will have to train uh, our residents. There's no, thing, no way about it. We'll have to train people and prove their proficiency in a way that's objective. So these are all the robots that are now uh, coming uh, soon. And even, sm even uh, simple uh, mechanical <coughs> instruments that allow you to get back your risk for minimally invasive uh, surgery are coming into the market. This is the FlexDex. It's a device that's made in the US and is in the market soon. <coughs> There are some others that allow you uh, similar uh, motion. This is one that uh, we've developed uh, in Israel that is hopefully going to be uh, in the market soon as well. Another device that is a five millimeter uh, device that uh, gives you back your wrist but is not a huge platform, does not cost a fortune, uh, has inter interchangeable uh, tips. Uh, and allows you to do complex uh, procedures without buying a $2 million uh, machine. And also uh, platforms that are mounted on flexible endoscopes uh, that will allow uh, you to, be, to, do, to do more complex procedures. I will skip that. But more robots uh, are, are coming. They're going to be cheap, so, and they're going to be easy to operate, and they're going to, to transform uh, the way we perform surgery. I think, though, this is, these trends, will, the problem with these trends will be to decide which one to adopt, because uh, most of them are costly and will require a few years to implement into a system. And I think, especially in the special situation in which we are in Israel, it will be difficult, very difficult to decide on how to implement them efficiently, and especially how to implement them cost efficiently. Uh, we also look at capsule endoscopy that, is, uh, that has now just been a, a, a diagnostic tool. But think of it, a capsule endoscopy that has a automatic identification of, a, of a polyps that can automatically biopsy them will make a big difference. <coughs> And I think that not in the far future we're going to have capsule endoscopes that will uh, make a determination of it's a small polyp, they can remove it completely and take it out. Um, and this will be completely automated. Uh, Doron spent some time on training, and, and Dr. Fried also spoke a lot about it. I think the most important thing about uh, training, uh, except for the fact that it will transform completely the way we teach and test uh, surgeons, not only young surgeons, but uh, surgeons my age, is uh, personalized uh, training. And I'm showing you an, an example from uh, Angio, but this is really fascinating. This is a, a, a simulator made by an Israeli company, Symbionics, uh, where you can feed your own patients uh, CT angiography and train a procedure on your specific patient. So this is a completely reconstructed anatomy of, of, of your specific patient in which you can stick virtual uh, catheters and virtual stents and virtual uh, balloons and train until you get, it, uh, you get it right. And using a simulator like that has been shown to reduce the radiation time for the patient from 30, 30 to 50 percent and reduce the number of unneeded instruments that are open during uh, the procedure that are very costly by about 30 percent. So if you can do this with a complex surgical procedure as well, which is to take your virtual, virtual patient, feed your CT scan or MRI into a machine, and then train on your hepatectomy or on your distal pancreatectomy 
or even on your breast uh, ablation, it will save a lot of time and make the procedure much uh, better. So now let's uh, look a little into the future of surgery, which is I don't think is in a very far future. Uh, I think that the two most important things to embrace are two technologies that are flexible endoscopy and uh, ablation, which is more like a little more imaging for us surgeons. I would like to, uh, for us to look around us and to other professions, even in, in surgery, and look at how they adopted uh, technologies that we kind of refuse to do. Gynecologists do ultrasound, do, do endoscopy, uh, do ablations. Urologists do endoscopy, do image-guided procedures, use robotics very, very much. Vascular surgeons quickly adopted uh, inter intravascular intervention and kept it within their profession because they are a disease-specific group of people. I have to remind you that, uh, that, that uh, people from the radiology world, from the imaging world, they are just the masters of technology. Just like you, you were saying about uh, laparoscopy, and you were probably right, uh, there, the fact that you master technology does not allow you to treat a specific disease or a specific patient. So we have to take these things. And in orthopedics, they use navigation and robotics. And bad examples are the cardiac surgeons who completely refuse to to adopt technologies and are now left with the horrible, bad cases that nobody wants to treat elsewhere, and with very, very few patients. So I know that we have all, all these futuristic uh, ideas of how the surgeon will sit in a cockpit in this fantastically decorated or beautiful uh, suite and be operating uh, seamlessly different types of uh, procedures, whether it is a uh, robotic procedure in one room or a flexible endoscopy uh, procedure in the other. But I think this is kind of nice to work towards this direction, but I think uh, we should adapt to much uh, simpler things in order to be on the right, uh, to be on the right train and advance with, with what we do and do better for our patients. So I think flexible endoscopy is a very important thing. Uh, we know that uh, with early detection, uh, we, will, we will see more and more patients with very small tumors, tumors that do not require necessarily a surgery. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of things that are uh, aiming towards early detection. Uh, a friend of mine in Korea, Yang Woo Kim, told me that in 2014, more than 50% of the cancers, not the polyps, the cancers in the stomach were removed endoscopically and not by surgery. Um, and a small example is a poem that's slowly replacing uh, Heller myotomy. I, I used to be do, doing about 20, 25 Heller myotomies a year until about two years ago where I haven't seen one patient in about two years. And my results were pretty good because the patients go to get it endoscopically. And uh, if we look at early detection, uh, I think it's a very important thing because the primitive way of doing a, a blood stool sample, a stool, a occult blood in your stool is going to go away quite soon. And with DNA, fecal DNA, uh, you'll be able to detect cancer much, much earlier and much more specifically. And therefore, many of the, our patients will not come to us uh, with polyps or with cancer that need any surgery at all. And there are even working towards blood tests that will pick up a, a fragmented RNA and tell you if a patient is likely you would be getting a specific cancer and then you can start screening. And this is not very far in the future. This is two or three years from now. The problem with flexible endoscopy is that the tooling for this uh, system are horrible. They were designed in the 80s. They don't, do not allow you to, to perform anything uh, really uh, complex. Uh, and this is, look, this is a team trying to do a, utilize the flexible endoscope to do a notes uh, called cystectomy. There are like five people bending over each other and, and, and pushing things, and it takes four hours. And th this is really not, not the way to go. So what will probably happen is that better platforms will be on the market very soon. Uh, ones that are automated and allow you in a very easy way to perform a procedure through a flexible endoscope that will allow you to resect a, a piece of a bowel wall and reconstruct it or remove polyps. <clears throat> and there's one system uh, from, 
from Singapore that is almost that. It's sort of like a small robot and a, on a, mounted on a flexible endoscope. Still very cumbersome, very inefficient, but, but working. And there are some ways magnetically to drive this thing through the bowel, but these are also not on the market yet. But, but what we need to do now is to start holding those stupid endoscopes in our hands so then when the next generation of endoscope will be in the market, we will be owning this technology. And there, there are some obstacles. Gastroenterologists control and use the technology. There is a big variation between countries. In Israel, it's almost a complete no-no for you to touch an endoscope. But there are other countries, like in, in, the, in North America, you cannot graduate to a surgical residency without doing flexible endoscopy. I think that upper GI surgeons and colorectal surgeons have to fight to get back the flexible endoscope in their hands. There's no reason for you to call somebody into the operating room to show you where a tumor is when you can't find it during laparoscopy. Uh, so I think in Israel, we need to do something active to regain our, our possibility to use flexible endoscope first in the operating room and then Whatever, whenever they come. And I think the arguments for that are that endoscopy, again, is a technology, it's not a disease. And all advanced endoscopic procedures were invented by surgeons. I don't know if you know that. ERCP, ESD, EMR, POEM, ligation of varices, pancreatic drainage, all these procedures were invented by surgeons using uh, flexible endoscopes. And we have to tell our gastroenterologist friends that we're not interested in screening patients, but we're only interest, interested in the therapy. And I think we have to fight to get a flexible endoscope into departments of surgery. <coughs> the second <coughs> part, and that was for treating hollow organs, colon, uh, stomach, esophagus, etc. The second trend, which is for solid organs, which would worry more hepatobiliary, pancreatic surgeons here, and urologists sometimes, is ablation technologies. Uh, so today we're using mostly RF, which is heating uh, tissue. <clears throat> it's uh, a very commonly used in, uh, around the world. There's a lot of data about it, but it's not a very good technology. Microwave technology is much more accurate and allows for much better ablation of uh, solid tumors. And cryoablation is also a, 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 an option, which is also a prob problematic in some organs, but it's very easy to follow under uh, ultrasound. So these are examples of uh, ablation of tumors in pancreas, in lung, now this, I think, is important uh, for many of us today. This is a cryoablation of a breast tumor. So breast is an external organ, uh, very easy to access, uh, very hard to, to do harm if you're careful. So this is an office procedure of a cryoablation of a fibroadenoma followed by an external ultrasound. You can see the tumor is penetrated. <clears throat> and you can follow very easily uh, uh, the ice ball that's forming. You, this could be done under local anesthesia or sometimes mild sedation if it's very deep. And I think the first people to worry, to sh that should worry about uh, solid organ ablation are breast surgeons. I, have ten I, I think that breast surgery is going to go completely away very, very soon. So you would say, okay, this is a fibroadenoma, this is no big deal. So this is the, this company, <coughs> which is also an Israeli company, iSense. This is their NIH trial on cryoablation of breast uh, fibroadenoma trial. It's been uh, a long time ago, and it's been already uh, running for a long time and finishing to recruit patients. But this is more interesting, I think. This is cryoablation of lower risk small breast cancers. And this is a study going on uh, for the past two years. And this is study with very good results. Uh, and I think that uh, now it's a small, low-risk breast cancer, but uh, after five years, it will be larger breast cancers uh, with a needle biopsy of uh, one uh, lymph node that could be marked. Uh, and then breast surgery will be history. <clears throat> and we are also moving from min minimally invasive to non-invasive surgery, which is a uh, uh, mostly focused ultrasound. Uh, Dawn showed you this. Uh, this is a threat to several of the procedures that perf we perform, uh, mostly uh, breast, but also uh, uh, liver. Uh, there, there are already commercial. This is one of the things that might kill completely the da Vinci, is this transrectal high-foot probe for, rectal, for prostate uh, cancer. 
uh, you can completely eliminate a tumor and you can see the you can see the nerves you can see the rectum and you can completely eliminate the tumor you know that in 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 uh, Prostate cancer many times you don't probably not, don't need many times don't need to operate at all but when you need to operate the oncological treatment could be compromised and could be repeated in many in many places so I think this might be able to completely get rid of uh, complex and very debilitating uh, surgery but in all of, in order to be involved in ablation we have to master imaging. And again, imaging that's available to us on a daily basis is ultrasound. And I think this is another technology that we should embrace now. And I'll tell you why. <clears throat> again, this is a technology uh, and many interventions under this technology, using this technology, were invented by surgery. Again, it's a tool like anything else, and it's very, very applic applicable. The obstacles are all, always, again, the hardware, the politics, the training, uh, and the the real estate, where, where do we work? So we can't buy a CT scan or an MRI to our uh, department of surgery or to our operating room, but we, can't, you, we can use ultrasound and we have to get used to it. I think ultrasound should be taught today as part of the physical examination of a patient. Uh, it's a point of care diagnostic tool. It, you can use it, of course, in trauma, but you can also use it very nicely in breast, in abdomen. And the nice thing about it, that ultrasound is becoming this. Like, this are, there, in the past two years, two of the major companies, Philips and GE, released ultrasound probes that are connected to your smartphone. So this could be in your pocket. And these are high accuracy ultrasounds. I mean, they, they do color Doppler, they do everything that you, you want a big ultrasound to be doing. And think of a resident walking on the floor and telling the, you the, the patient has fluid in his chest, so you can tell you the patient has three centimeters of turbid fluid in his chest, not just by listening. The patient has an abscess in, in his liver. The patient has fluid in his abdomen. Or the patient has a, a portal vein thrombosis following surgery. And this could be done on the spot by your resident doing rounds. This should be done today. So I think what needs to be done is that we have to embrace these technologies. And I would, if I politically will try to do something, I will, I will focus on flexible endoscopy. And, and ultrasound as a gate to ablation and more complex flexible procedures. Uh, I will try to move all these things back to the hands of surgeons and fight for it. Uh, I think that uh, even if we don't do all these political fights with unions, we can slowly bring these instruments into our departments and into our hands and send people to train to, to use them well. And I think we have to develop tools that will help us do whatever we want and not just adapt tools that are not meant uh, for our procedure. I think that it's very important we will be proactive about it. Many of us, when they refuse to adopt a minimally invasive surgery, we slowly push to a non-minimally invasive surgery career, which I think does not make sense. You need to, be, to master all the tools that are available for your, for your uh, trade, and then choose what to use on which patient, and not be confined by the tools you know how to use and the tools you don't know how to use. And I think that we don't need to uh, be worried about the political implications and the little wars that we have to uh, be uh, engaged in to, ex to achieve all these things, but simply move on and try to do the best for, for us and for our patients. Thank you.